That's, do you want to do introductions again? Yeah. Uh, and I'm Sarah Mannheimer. I'm a librarian, and I am learning R as well in the process, always in the process. Hi, I'm Greta Lindsay. I'm the Interim Director of Statistical Consultant Services. Um, I'm the Senior Project Manager Lab, which is Social Science Research at Stanford. And um, I've been using R for many years, and, but I'm still learning. <laughs> Great. Okay, so we are. Yeah. Great. So we're going to talk today about sort of extending what we learned in the intro and data viz class uh, workshops. We'll talk about relational operators, how to join sequences of relational operators together with logical operators. We'll create some conditional statements, so if-else statements. We'll create for loops, and then we'll also create some functions of our own. And I think most people have seen this already. We used this online tutorial last week, but basically this workshop is assuming that you have a little bit of familiarity with R. Um, yeah. What's that? Oh, and um, the other thing I forgot to make sure is that you have the link to the tutorial. This was emailed out to you, but it's this at the top of the screen. Get this to go away. The thing I forgot to make sure is that you have the link to the tutorial. This was emailed out to you but it's this at the top of the screen. Get this to go away. Oh, Elliot put it in the chat. It is. Oh. Let's close the door too, do you mind? So it's rconnect.math.montana.edu slash capital intermediate capital R. So this is what we'll be using. Um, just like if you attended the data viz workshop, this is an online tutorial that allows you to sort of play around with code without having our studio installed on your machine. And so each little box that you'll see is like a little sandbox and it each box doesn't rely on the code that you've done before. So we've programmed it in so that everything goes in order, but it's kind of just a way to really think about only the code. And then we don't have to worry about if there are technical issues with our studio. So hopefully this is helpful to you. Uh, and then we also have some challenges that we'll work through and Answers to the challenges are available within the tutorial. I'll show you. Let me do that next. So, for example, this first. Um, I'll show you. Oh, yeah, thanks. When you go to the challenge, I'm not seeing the answer. Oh yeah, here we go. The solution is here. So this is hopefully you can come back to this later. And if you're having issues, there is a solution. It's not always the only way to do something, but those are available to you. And those are in the handout as well. If you saw that PDF handout that I emailed earlier. So, okay. So first let's talk about a little bit of refresher. So the workshop, covers content that requires we remember how to extract elements from vectors and data frames. So let's do a few warm ups just to get us started. First, to extract an element from a vector, we use this bracket notation. So a vector only has one dimension. So inside the brackets will go one number. And you get 
you extract some um, an element using the corresponding index number. So they start from number one. So for example, in this vector, we have, this is index number one, index number two, index number three, et cetera. So if we run this X and then the bracket notation with one, that'll extract that first element. So you can see it gives you that first number 5.4. Then you can also use the notation with colon one colon three to extract inclusive one through three. Um, and you can also use a negative, like a, yeah, a minus sign to exclude something. So here at the last one we do X minus two, that excludes the second index. So let's do a very quick challenge here. What is R produce? Why does R produce an error when you run the following code? Everything except one. Yeah. Three, like... Right. The everything except one is sort of a different idea than one to three. So you can go. If you want to view everything except one to three, then you could just go oops, two to three. That's one way to do it. That'll show between one and three, but without one. Or you can do, say you don't want one. Can you use a comma? No. You could do everything except one. How else can I do this? Try doing those first. See if that would be useful. That worked. We have not one. Yeah, and then six point two seven point one. Nope, that's not working. It's just so first it runs. Ah. Nice. So you can play around with that in the sandbox as you like. That's coming up. Yeah. Um, and then let's extract some elements from a data frame. So a vector is one dimensional data frame. It has two dimensions columns and rows. And so then we can extract two types of elements. So here's our example. We're making a little data frame where row A is 1, 5, 9, 13, row B, 2, 6, 10, etc. So then we can use this example. Uh, and we so we created the data frame and we named it example underscore df. That's what this code is doing. So and see you can uh, you can type in these uh, boxes however you like and um, do your own code. So let's say we want to print out the whole data frame where we can see. So we have column A, column B, column C, column D. And if you want to extract something, you use this um, dollar sign notation. So here we extracted column A. That's what's showing in the one here. Or we could try, give it a try yourself, extracting column D maybe. And then you'll see it's showing below column D, which is that 4, 8, 12, 16. So you can also then extract a column using that bracket notation that we used in the vectors, but you use the, you do use the comma for this one. So here is a few examples, and then we have them notated with a comment. So if you say one comma one, it extracts the first row, the first column entry. So that would be looking at our full data frame, first row, first column is the number one. Or you can do a blank one, comma one, which would extract every row in the first column. So that would be one, five, nine. 
And then you can do the opposite, extract every column in the first row, which would be one, two, three, four. Showing below here. So let's do a little challenge. Change the code below to extract the third and fourth columns from our example data frame up to here. So you'll want column C and column D. So using what we learned in the vector example and in the data frame example. And then raise your hand when you're done. <laughs> Different languages. Using that same colon notation, if we say we don't want any any row, any row, but we want columns three and four inclusive of each other. Cool. And you can use the solution to do that too. And then how would you change the code above to extract the second and fourth columns? So write your own code. You can use this example here. this <laughs> but you hopefully did it yourself so oh because i'm a mac user that always is hard for me okay nothing from the first row but for columns we use this concatenate function it's kind of a trick question because we haven't showed you this yet and then um run that code so you use concatenate with a two and a four. Maybe we should add that above where we show that concatenate function in the first exercise. Cool. Questions? This is sim the simplest part. So um, talk about relational operators. So this is um, shows how one object relates to each, each other. And there are a few relational op operators you can use so we'll talk through a few examples. So first we're like creating a few objects. We are creating a W in this code chunk, an X, a Y, a Z, a DNA one and a DNA two. And then we'll work through these ideas of inequalities and using some of these relational operators to investigate values. So you can use an equals to find out whether it's equivalent or a not equals to find out whether it is not. So let's run that code. Okay, so DNA1 does not equal DNA2. You can see they're just a little bit different. And so you're like, does DNA1 not equal DNA2? True. Makes sense. Um, and then we can also use greater than or less than. So these are should be familiar to you from math class, but there's a bit of a twist. So to write greater than, you use those carrots greater than or less than. If you want to add greater than or equals to, you just use those one at a time, greater than equals or less than equals. So we've got, let's run this code. Is W greater than 10? Yes. Is X greater than Y? No. You can re remember the values here, or you can write them in just to remind yourself. Oops. So here I've printed out W to remind myself, okay, is W greater than 10? Yeah. And Y too. Is the X greater than the Y? No. Okay. Um, then using, you can check whether a character number or factor is included in a vector using the percent in percent operator, the inclusion operator. And so 
you can here we're linking these three um, strings of characters, basically green, pink, red, into a vector. And then we're saying, is blue in this vector of colors? The answer is false, because we just have green, pink, red. Then we can create this vector of numbers. And we ask, is five in numbers? The answer is true. Here's another example. We've created a vector called some letters with A, B, C, D, E. And then we ask, are A and B in some letters? And it says true, true. So we could change this, like say, oh, is Q and B, are those in some letters? And it'll say false, true, because Q is not in that vector and B is. All making sense? So let's do a little challenge. Um, write the code for each of these four um, ideas. Is two times X plus 0.2 equal to Y? Is hello greater than or equal to goodbye? Is true greater than false, et cetera. I'll give you just one minute to do that. Did, you, did we need to have run those two things? No, that, because of the way this sandbox works, we have everything coded in as though it's already run. But if you were working on your own machine, you would, you would have to do that. Okay. Yeah. How do you do with all of those? And we introduced this new function for you, nCare, to figure out how long a string is. So this is asking, is DNA1 longer than five bases? So when we use that nCare function, we find out it's actually 15. There's 15 letters in that DNA1 string. Actually, let's print it out. So that's more than five. So you could say this greater than five. And you get the answer, yes. Questions there? Okay, let's keep going to compare decimal value numbers. So that's you, sweet. Okay, so let's take a quick look back at what we saw in that challenge three. So when we looked at if two times X plus 0 0.2, if that was equal to Y, so we can't just use just the equal sign because that's as if we're doing actually like math, double equal sign checks, is it equal to? So we got false here, but if we look back at what X and Y are, if we do them separately, two X plus 0.2, and then print Y. So if I print these separately, I see they're both supposed to be 2.8. So why, when we ran that one line, why did we get false for an answer? That seems counterintuitive, right? So R is very, very smart, sometimes smarter than we are. Um, it does need a little bit of leading sometimes when we're running certain things. So when we're comparing decimal value numbers, sometimes there is a discrepancy on where R automatically rounds to when it's estimating these numbers. And although it prints out to one decimal place for both of these, so we assume they should be the same, it may indicate that they are not technically equal because it's rounding to different values. So to work around that, we have a function in R called all.equal. And here we can type all.equal and then put in our two arguments separated by a comma, and it'll actually check 
with a certain rounding that is the same for both arguments, um, whether they are actually equal. So we'll type in the two times x plus two plus two, comma, y. So when we run that code, it's true. So when they're rounding to the same decimal place, those are in fact equal. You can also set tolerance in all dot equal just using another argument that's ANC or ENC? ANC. Um, tolerance equal, and you could set it to a value that you like. The default is a very, very small value. So it does rounding out quite a bit of num like past the decimal. Okie dokie. Let's look at comparing characters. So again in challenge three, when we were looking at hello is greater than or equal to goodbye, these are both words, right? We're comparing two words. So how are we supposed to know if it's greater than or equal to? It doesn't make sense to compare those things, right? But it still gives us true. It does compare these somehow, which is quite interesting. And we'll see even if we run this line here, it'll give us the same thing, saying that hello is in fact greater than goodbye. Does anyone have any guesses for why this is the case? Great thinking. So exactly, I'm so proud of you. Okay, so when are, like we've seen before when we're dealing with levels of a categorical variable, our defaults to putting in alphabetical order, right? So it sort of ranks these saying like A is the first, B is the second, C is the third. So within the ones you're comparing, it ranks them alphabetically. Since in the alphabet, G comes before H, G would be a value less than, so G would be first, hello would be second, G is a value less than H, so H is in fact greater than. So since it starts with the letter H, it's going to be greater than a word that starts with the letter G. But as I'm sure you know, dictionaries and alphabetical orders may differ a little bit all over the world. So obviously the language you're dealing with or the dictionary you're working with is going to have some impact on what you get for these logical results when you're dealing with words. So this function right here, sets your system to use a certain dictionary based off your time zone. So this one locates says, okay, I know what time zone you're in and automatically does the default di dictionary associated with that region, which is really cool. Okay, so let's look at another challenge. What if you're not in the locale? What if you're not in that time zone, but you want to check a different time? Zone? Like a sure. Yeah, so you can change the dictionary to whatever you want. So it doesn't have to get. If you don't have to use the automatic location, you can overwrite it to a different. Just to repeat that for WebEx viewers, you can override the automatic location. So you could set it to a certain dictionary as well. Did you have more to say? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Okay, let's take a look at challenge four. So what is going on in the code below? So first, let's just start, let's look at what sum letters is to remind ourselves what we're looking at. So sum letters itself is a vector of these five values. We have A, B, C, D, E. This, what we looked at before. So we know equals equals is asking, is it equal to? But the exclamation point, which we also call a bang, if we do a bang equals, this is saying not equal to. And then we have a concatenate, so a vector of two variables or two elements, just A and C. So when we run this code, we get a warning, then we get false, true, 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 true. Something's up, right? That's not what we were expecting to see. So let's figure out what is going on here. R does this thing called recycling, and it, it's not like recycle your cans. It's kind of the same idea, but it's using it again. <laughs> um, so what R does here, when you have a longer vector first, you're comparing to a shorter vector after the relational operator, it recycles the shorter vector until you get something of equal or greater length comparing to your longer vector. So what this is doing is it's gonna take this, but it doesn't know what to put in these last three slots. So what it does is it gets recycled and it repeats itself until it's either equal to that length or greater than that length. So as you can see here, we're gonna ignore the not equals to. If we were comparing if this was equal to, A is equal to A, so we would expect that to be true. The bang is gonna switch that, 
So it's going to give us false. So A is not equal to A. A is equal to A. So the opposite of that is going to be false. Does that make sense? A little like wrap around, model, but um, then we can look at B is equal to C. Those aren't equal. So this is going to be true. And you can go the rest of the way and infer by it's doing that. So a fun way to kind of achieve this too is you can actually put the shorter vector, the shorter length vector first and your longer second, and it should work out okay most of the time for you then. So now we're going to look at this with our inclusion operator. So this is the percent in percent. So first let's look at this without the bang. And so now we're seeing if these two letters are in the vector sum letters. The vector sum letters, whether those five or five elements, that's A, B, C, and D, E. So when we run this, it's going to give us true, true. So it's doing this element-wise. So it's, it's saying, is this A in some letters? That's true. Is B in some letters? That's also true. So when we negate this, what are we expecting to see? False, false, exactly. That's what we get. Boom. Okay, now let's look at some logical values. So logical values are what we've already been kind of dealing with. So these are those true and false. You may have noticed already that both of these words are always typed out in all caps. So there's actually two ways you can do logical values in R. So you can either have just a capital first letter. Oh, not that. Just a capital T will automatically read as true. Or you have to have the completely capital full word. Same for false. Capital F will suffice as false. But if I try to type out true with some lowercase letters or all lowercase, R is not going to recognize that. You can see it already auto-completes and wants me to pick that so it can actually read it as true. It's trying to read my mind and it's actually doing a pretty good job here, which is great. So and um, if you can see color, um, logical there is blue and words or, or vectors. Um, Named objects are in black. Yes. Uh, unless you change your color. But <laughs> <laughs> in default R, that's what they so are. So do you want to repeat that for the Oh, absolutely. So Greta mentioned that logical values, they're in blue in default R, unless you've changed your um what is it called? R theme or display color scheme. Color scheme. Um and then vector names or object names are usually in black. So you can tell the difference. R will read it as a logical value if it is in fact in blue. Thank you for that. That's a good point to make. Okie dokie. So some letters, we can also kind of use these logical values to tell them what we want to extract. This is not the most straightforward method, but in some cases it can be very helpful to use. So here it's telling us our some letters were five letters A, B, C, D, E, right? So it's saying within that, true, I want A, I want B, I don't want C, don't want D, don't want E. So when we get output, what are we expecting to see? It's A and B, right? Perfect. And it does that. It can read our minds. So it's not always the most intuitive to use this way to extract elements, but it is an option and it may be helpful in some cases. So it's worth knowing. Now let's take a look at the which function, so, or the which statement. So which is special? Which returns indices of the value? So it's finding the location of an element, not the element itself, which is very tricky because the first time you use this, everybody's like, that's not what I thought it was going to do. And if you don't know what's going on, it can be a heck of a time trying to figure it out. So what it's doing is it's going to locate elements. So first, I am going to run, oh my goodness gracious, there we go. So I'm saving my x2 vector here, and now I'm asking which elements in x2 are greater than 8. So especially if you haven't run this yet, which elements in this vector are greater than 8? 9, 11, 13, 15. However, when we actually run this, Oh, wrong. We get four, five, six, and seven. That's not what we were expecting, right? 
So what this is actually doing is it's telling us these are the locations within that vector where numbers satisfy this condition. So the fourth place, fifth place, and sixth place. So if we go back, just look at our vector really quick. Look at one, two, three, four. That's where nine starts. All of those past there are greater than eight. So it's telling you the location. So be careful when you use the which function. It's not telling you the actual value that's there, just where to locate it. So now let's look at the next one. So which elements of x equals two are equals equals? So r equal to seven. What do you think it's going to give us? Three, because it's in the third position in this vector. Let's make sure it gives us that. Perfect. You guys are brilliant. I'm so proud of you. Sweet. So now let's talk about some matrices. So we've talked about vectors before, right? Where that's just a string of you can have characters, numbers, all sorts of jazz pushed together in one thing you're going to use. <laughs> So we can actually combine multiple vectors in a matrix. One way to do that is to use the data.frame function. We're going to name a vector, call it this, say what's in my vector, and I'm going to name multiple, separate them with commas as you do normal arguments. So here, our arguments themselves are vectors. You could do this in multiple steps where you do, okay, Cupid, I'm going to define it up here. I'm going to define match up here, and then I'm just going to put the names. That should also work, right? Okay, so your arguments here are vectors, so you could do it outside or nested within like we have in this example. So in this example, we're going to go on a dating show. <laughs> um, we're looking at two different dating sites. We're looking at OkCupid and Match.com. And this is the number of messages that one person, our lucky contestant, has received in a day across the whole week. So let's go ahead. going to run our vector. This, we shouldn't expect any output because this is just saving it. I'm going to call it messages. Now, a good thing to do is to always add, add row names so I know, like, which day is first. What are we talking about? So when I add this, I should add the row names. And then I can, oh, my goodness. I can actually type the thing itself, and we can see it all printed out. So now we have a very nice matrix with the days of the week as row names and our two columns with OkCupid okay, and match. Notice that our vectors, although they're input and it almost seems like it would be a row, they're actually input as vectors or as columns in our matrix and data frame. So now another challenge for you. So we're gonna use this me messages matrix to return a matrix of logical values that answers the following question. For what days were the number of messages at either site greater than 12? So here, we can just take our vector messages. And then what symbol do I use for greater? One of the carrots, right? Perfect. Greater than 12. So it's as easy as that. And it'll give me a printed out data frame, keeping the row names, keeping the column names. And tells me on Monday, OKCupid okay, did have more than 12 messages. That is true. And we'll do that for each of the observations. Feeling okay? Okay. Now we got a spicy challenge. Are you guys ready? <laughs> you warmed up? <laughs> okay. So we're going to use the messages matrix to return the rows of messages that answer the following questions. So this is where we're going to think back to that bracket notation that we saw earlier. So we're used to seeing the normal parentheses, normal just curvy parentheses. Those are used when you have a function. When you're trying to index within an object, whether it be a vector or matrix or whatever you're dealing with, that's when we're gonna use those square brackets. So here, when we're gonna index into that, we're gonna think of our square brackets. And since we have rows and columns, we have two dimensions here. We're gonna have square bracket, comma, square bracket, and it's gonna be rows, comma, columns. We want to do that. So we're thinking back to that. So this one's spicy because we're going to have a lot of nesting to deal with, <laughs> and it'll make more sense in a second. So here we know we, we want to do something with the messages matrix, right? So let's start there. Messages. I know I want to index into it somewhere to get something. So I want to see only the rows that give me 
where messages at OkCupid are equal to 13 for the first one. So I can use which of the functions, it's a hint, <laughs> that we've already gone over. The which function, right? So let's play with the which function. So since this one is a function, we're going to use the normal parentheses. Put that in there. And then we're going to index into that and say, we just want to see the OK Cupid in this one, right? We don't care about match yet. So I'm actually going to take the name of my vector, use that trick we reviewed earlier that I can dollar sign into one of my columns. OK Cupid. And then I want to see when were they equal to 13. But what am I missing here? Two equals, exactly. Great answer. Because this is just saying, this is actually like we're doing an operation. I'm going to say, is it equal? Which is this true? So when I run that code, and define columns, great. Did I spell something wrong? Oh, exactly. I mentioned it. And I forgot it myself. OK. So we're just talking about the rows, so we want this just like on the rows part. So when we square bracket in, it's rows, comma, columns. So we can put a comma. And we're not really interested. We just want all the elements from those co columns um, that satisfy this condition. So we don't have to put anything after the comma. So just to write it out, when you index into something, you're going to have your object name. Oh, yep. Square brackets. And if it's of two dimensions, like a data frame or a matrix, you're going to have rows, comma, and notice that just as a reminder, when I put this hashtag, this comments it out, so it won't actually affect the code I'm running. This is just a note to myself as a reminder. Okay, now so let's. When I sorry, when I did which messages OK Cupid equals equal out a comma. Mm -hmm. I got a list of all of the rows. Interesting. Without the comma? Didn't get an error, I just got. Okay. Is there any differences in how these look? Do you have any idea why that looks? Uh, does it matter that I have um, capital letters? Yes. So R is case sensitive. It does matter whether you have capital letters or lowercase letters. Um, if it doesn't match exactly what the variable name is typed as, it won't understand what you're trying to point at or get it to call. So when you do turn all to lowercase, do you get the undefined columns? Yeah. Okay. You Interesting. I wonder. Okay. Interesting. Does it not come up all lowercase? Yeah, we pro uh, we have it's some things good. that are saved. Oh, uh, in the back end for use between sandboxes, and so it's just pulling up something that is in and out. Good question, then. Okay, let's take a shot at the second part of this challenge. So now we want to know which rows were were the messages at OK Cupid great at OK Cupid greater than the number of messages that match. So start at the basic. We're going to look in our messages data frame. We're going to index into it somehow. I know I want something in there, right? So we can use our which function again. Or which since it's a function, normal parentheses. And now I want to compare two of the variables within my data frame. So I can kind of steal what I did here where I indexed into one of the variables and I want to compare within messages. Compare OK Cupid. And I want to see how when they're greater than match. So I'm going to use the greater than symbol. And then what am I going to do to get match here? Exactly. Which is dollar sign. What am I missing? Exactly, perfect. It's the thing that gets me every time personally. And let's go ahead and run that. 
and it'll print out a data frame for me. So this is, I think it's a different way than doing it as a solution say, yep, so you're indexing in specifically into the first column and the second column to get OKCupid okay, and match. This is another way you can do it with the dollar sign notation. It does make it longer coding, but they do the same things. Um, the output will be a little different though. Um, this one, instead of telling me just the days, this is gonna give me a data frame with the days and the numbers there. What's up? Why, uh, why is there a, why is Sometimes the, the learn R environment has obscure warnings. Um, so don't worry about that. <laughs> this shouldn't give you a warning if you're doing these actually in R, but just because learn R is great for sandboxes and helping us, it does come up with warnings that in this case are unneeded. So. so. Now let's explore the subset function. So subset, it's gonna take an object and a condition you give it, and then return all of the things within that object that meet that condition. Feeling okay with that? Okay. <laughs> so let's first make an object so it can understand and we can reference one. So I'm just saving this vector as my X3. And then within the subset function, my first argument Arguments are just the things inside a function separated by commas. My first argument is gonna be the object itself. And then my second is I'm gonna give it a condition that I want it to satisfy. And if those things are, if an element satisfies that, it's gonna be included in the subset. If it does not, it's gonna be thrown away. So I wanna see within X3, I want all of the elements that are greater than six. So what am I expecting when I run this code? Which two elements is it going to drop? Just three and five. So let's go ahead and run that. And it did what we expected it to. It has the name of the vector. Yes, you have to have the object first. That's what it's expecting, unless we talked about pipe operators, yeah? The percent greater than percent. Can you do that? I'll that's that it? Later. Okay, more of that later, <laughs> but great question. Let's look at challenge seven then. So using the OKCupid okay data from above, we're gonna answer this question. So we're gonna change the which statement to a subset statement, extracting the number of days, extracting the days that the number of messages at OKCupid okay is greater than the messages that match. So let's scroll up to challenge six, steal that code. Paste it here to work with. So I'm actually going to start, oh my goodness, <laughs> on a separate line and use parts of this code, but I'm not actually going to change that code itself. I'm just going to reference it for this example. So, first of all, we know we want to use subset instead of which, right? So if I'm taking, I'm going to take out what we've indexed in the rows and I'm going to paste that on another line. So now I just don't have the square brackets, I don't have the first object name, and I don't have the comma. I'm gonna change this which, to now we wanna look at what function? Subset, exactly. I'm gonna type in subset. So we're missing one thing here though. What is the first argument in the subset function? It's not the condition right away, it's the object, right? So we need to put the object name first. So messages, comma, and then we can have our condition. So I'm just going to put hashtag here. That way, comments that code out, it shouldn't affect what results we get, and run it there. Uh, does it not work? Messages. Oh, thank you so much. I do math all day. I'm not very good at English. <laughs> Okay, thank you for catching that. And now we see it's printed out the rows, the entire rows, um, and we can see the days. So I think this one is a little different than the solutions too. So same thing, this is indexing into the first column. So that's telling me I just want the okay Cupid. Does the same thing as this does. Same with this second column. It says second column in my data frame. I want to look at the match. So two ways to do same thing. 
Now let's look at logical. So one thing to know, a little nuance, that we've seen when we're talking about logicals, we've been referring to the true and false values, right? These are logical values. Now we're gonna look at logical statements, which have logical operators. So just a ton of vocab thrown at you. So statements have some sort of operator there. Operators are like, when I wanna do addition, my plus sign is my operator, subtraction minus sign, it does an operation. Statements is comparing two things with an operator. So there's three ways we can do this. The first is with an and statement. So this is where we use that ampersand. Um, in case you don't know where it is, you're gonna press the shift key on your keyboard and then hit the seven, and that's how you're gonna get your ampersand. So the ampersand is special though, because it only returns true if all of the relational statements are true. So if you have even one false, it's gonna return false. All of them have to be true. So a couple examples. Is three less than five? That's true. And is nine greater than seven? That is also true. So since true and true, we're gonna get a true out of this. With this one, three is not greater than five. So we're gonna get false and true. So it's gonna get us a false. Both of them have to be true for and to get a true. Then our second statement is or. So this is where we have our vertical bar or our pipe. But be careful when you call it a pipe because there is a certain like pipe operator using an R that's more commonly referred to as a pipe. So we would suggest just calling it a vertical bar, even though it is kind of more to say. This one is located on your keyboard when you press shift and then the key above your enter key. So it's kind of in a strange spot, especially if you haven't seen it before. What this does is it reads as or. So if I'm telling you something, do you want to do this or this? If one of them is a yes, We'll go do something. So it's kind of the same deal with that, just with numericals and math. So if at least one is true, it's gonna give you a true. So three is greater than five, that one's false, or nine is greater than seven, that's true. Since one is true, it's gonna give us true. If they're both false, like three greater than five, false, nine less than seven, false, it's gonna give us a false. If you have both true, what is it gonna give you? True, because you have true or true. As long as one of them is true, it'll give you true. Now we have not. So we've seen this a little bit before when we were doing equals equals and then we were doing not equals to, right? So this, they call, you probably know it as an exclamation point. They call it a bang also. So if you hear that terminology, you're not just like, what's going on? So we can use the bang to negate statements. So essentially what this does is negates whatever comes after it. So you have to put it before your statement that you want negated. That's why it's not equals to the bang comes before the equal sign as well. So this one is a little backwards logic because you have to be cognizant that the bang is there, otherwise you're gonna get unexpected results. Because if I do is numeric five, I know that's true. But if I negate it, I want it to see false because five is a numeric data type. Feeling okay with that? Sounds good. Okay, one thing to note, sometimes you may see in code where people use the double ampersand or the double bar. Those are not the same as their single counterparts. They do not do the same thing. So instead of doing an and where both of them have to be true to get a true result, this, the double ampersand, will only evaluate the first element of an object. So it's not looking at all of the things within an object, especially if you're dealing with objects with a lot of elements, it's only gonna look at the first one and can give you misleading results. Same with the bar, it's only gonna evaluate the first one if you have the double bar. So this one, if you're, this one is where it gets a little tricky too, because if you're dealing with something with multiple elements, and neither of the first ones are true, it's gonna give you a false. But with the single bar, as long as at least one of them are true, it gives you true. So it's not considering the rest of the elements. And if you have a true in the rest of the elements, it could give you misleading results as well. So let's <laughs> look at these a little bit closer. So within this example, we're just doing one ampersand. So this is and. So we need both of them to be true for it to give us a true, right? So in this sense, when we're comparing logical values in a logical statement, 
we're seeing if they match is essentially what we're doing. So we're going to take the first element here. Does it match the first element there? Yes. So what's it going to give us? True. Um, for the second element, it does not match. So we're expecting false. And then the second element, it does match, but it's both false. So here you have to have, well, actually, let me run it to make sure. I think you have to have two trues to have a true, especially with and. So with the ampersand, this is giving you a false statement. So think of it, there could also be a statement here asking you is three greater than five. That's going to give you a false result. Since there is already one false result, it's going to opt to give you false. Feeling okay about that? Okay. So I guess I misspoke when I said if they match. This is just a way to think of like if you plug in statements there is a better way to think about it. Okay, now let's look at the bar. So what does the bar mean? Is this our and or, or not? This is our or. So as long as one of the elements is true, then we're going to have true, right? So we're going to match these up element wise. So when I match the first ones, is one of them true? They're both true. So we're going to expect a true. Second, at least one of them is true. So we're going to expect a true here. And then no trues in the third element. So we're going to expect that to, oh my goodness. We're going to expect that to be false. Here we are. Run that, expecting true, true, false. And that's what we get. Okay. So now on the last one, this is where our caution comes in. So when we're doing the two ampersands, it only considers the first element of the both things you're comparing. So when we run it, I'll run it first to show you. Instead of giving us what we expect, the three different elements, it only gives us the one because it only compares the first elements. So since this is true and this is true, both are true, but it's only doing the first, it's going to give us a true out. Feeling okay? I know I'm saying a lot of the same words again and again. <laughs> Please ask questions if you get mixed up. Or especially if I get mixed up too. Let's look at challenge eight. Okay, we got two parts to this challenge. The first one, we're going to see if the last day of the week is under five messages or above 10 messages. So, first of all, we have to discern what is the last day of the week in our sense. So, they do give us a very helpful hint. I'm going to take that hint, copy that in, put it in there. So, but I'm going to go ahead and highlight just this part of it, just to see what the tail is doing. So, when I just run the tail part, it's telling me 14. Oh, no, I just want. Okay, so it's going to give me Oh, no. Ignore that. So, when I run this whole thing, it's going to run the last row. So, tail is going to give us the very last row. That end says I only want the last one row. If we have a bigger number there like 10, it's going to give me the last 10 rows, but in this case, we only have 7 rows for the days of the week. So, we're only interested in the very last day. So this is say, I'm going to say, I want the one last row in OKCupid. So I'm going to save that as last. After that, I'm going to print out last. And that should get me what I'm trying to show you. 14. Okay. So let's go ahead and look back at that data frame. Here we are. So what it's doing is it's giving me the last value in OKCupid, but I can see here that my last value is on a Sunday. Okay. So now, what'd you say? Okay, sorry. <laughs> so now we can use this last to do some operations on. So we want to find out um, is the last day of the week under five messages or above 10 messages? So what we can do is we don't actually have to index into this in this case. So we could just put those side by side with a relational operator. Which 
that says I just want the very last observation. So I want the one last observation. If I have n equals two, it's going to give me the two last observations in that column. And then whatever number you specify tells you how many. Yeah. Great question. Um, so here, the first part of this is under five messages. So I'm going to use less than five. And then what relational operator do I want here? Four. And what's the symbol for that? The bar, right? So we're going to go shift our bar. And then I'm going to use the name again and say last. And now I want to see if it's above 10, so greater than. So when I run that, it's going to tell me true. And I already saw that when I just print out last, it's 14, right? So since it's or, only one of the things has to be true to return a true, and we can tell that which one is as satisfying as true. Is it less than five or greater than 10? 14 is greater than 10. So that's the one that's satisfying. Okay, now let's do some more with it. So now we wanna see if the last day of the week, um, is it between 15 and 20 messages, excluding 15, but including 20? This is where we can add a little bit to our like greater than or less than, we can include with greater than or equal to or less than or equal to and exclude if we don't include the equal sign. So here, I'm gonna do something very similar. I'm gonna take my last and I'm gonna exclude 15 so I don't need an equal sign, right? I just want the greater than, greater than 15. And then what relational operator am I gonna use? And, perfect. And that is our and plus and, just the one. And then type last again. And here I want to include 20. So these, the order you type it out is exactly how you would read it. So is this less than or equal to 20? So the equal sign always usually comes after. I'm going to run that. What are we expecting when I run it? True. So we know the value last. When I just look at the value last, what does that give me? Oh, my goodness. Well, the value last is supposed to be 14 because that's how many messages we got on Sunday from OKCupid. So since it's 14, is it greater than 15? It's not. And means both of them have to be true. So we don't even have to read the second statement to know what this is going to give us, right? What answer is this going to give us? False. Going to go ahead and give us false. And there it prints out my 14 <laughs> after I needed it. Okie dokie. How are we feeling on this one? Feeling okay? So it might be, no, go ahead, ask your question. If you don't, where in your data set Sunday's data is, like if you wanted to get Wednesday's data. Gotcha. Is that easy enough? How do we subset into row names? Um, We're almost done with your part. We'll come back to it. Okay. Okay. Um, Sounds good. <laughs> we're gonna. Charlie's gonna finish at this page. We'll take a little bit of a break, and then we'll start with that. Okay. Great leading question. <laughs> um, one last thing on this challenge. It might be like when you're in a math class, or and you're writing out actually an operation. It may be kind of gut instinct to say like a value is less than my object is less than another value. Let's see how R treats that. So if we were gonna look at the last one and say 15, I think last is gonna be greater than 15. I wanna see greater than or equal or less than or equal to 20. If I run that, let's see what it gives us. So it gives us an error. So R doesn't like to read it the way we would normally write it out shorter and more condensed in say a math class or just by itself. It does need those relational operators to understand that it needs conditions too. So that one. And then last little bit of the challenge, we're gonna look at the subset command. So just a reminder, let's walk through what these are saying. So this is our function, since it's function, 
regular parentheses. First element, our argument in our subset is always our object. So here we're using the messages data frame. And then we put our condition. So we can take that condition and put it in here. So we're looking at when OKCupid okay is less than six messages or match is less than six messages. So notice that if either is true, it's considered a bad day. <laughs> You're not getting enough messages from either one, it's a bad day. So when I run that, you can see Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday are bad days. And it does say what we expected. Since it's or, only one have to meet those conditions. It doesn't necessarily have to be both. Now for good days, we want to see them both have a lot of messages, right? We want our contestant to be successful in their dating life. So same setup here, function, normal parentheses, object, and now our conditions. So OKCupid okay, has to be greater than 10 and match has to be greater than 10. So all the days where this is true, both of these are true, that's going to be considered a good day. So when we run that, you can see that Monday, Saturday, and Sunday are our good days. Dollar sign because we've already defined the object. Yes, in this case, that I think, yep, yeah. that does work. Absolutely. Okay, let's take a short how long of a break? Five minutes? All right, so um, this is, we, we call this intermediate R. Um, because this is the middle of where we want to end in our series. Um, but a lot of the topics here are things that we don't often think about. So it's actually in some ways advanced R. Um, it's very technical, um, logistical or logical thinking. Um, and so if you're a little bit overwhelmed with the tedium of going through today's lecture or today's workshop, we understand that. Um, also, what's you know, Harley is fighting with this a little bit more than I am because a lot of this is the old way of doing R or talking to R, coding in R, but it's important to understand what's actually happening so that when we talk about um, more advanced or newer ways of um, programming in the next workshop, um, we call that the tidy way. Uh, it helps us understand what's actually going on when we just use more functions rather than asking questions directly. So there's a little bit of push and pull between the old way and the new way. And sometimes it's easy for us to um, be tempted to, to skip ahead to the next workshop. Um, one of the, yes. 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 Next week or next or two weeks um, uh, in the data wrangling. We'll primarily use um, the tidy R package, which we talked about a little bit with data wrangling, um, mostly to get the ggplot functions. Um, but then that's what we'll bring in the other type um, in uh, the percent greater than percent symbol it, um, to talk to or to pass things along our system. Uh, another way of um, an old fashioned way of doing things is row names. We don't typically recommend using row names anymore. Um, it works in this particular case for the, these examples. Um, but even though it's not the best way to program, I don't know how many times I've actually encountered data where people have actually named their rows. So it's important to be able to know that you can have row names and work with them, even though it's kind of a leg legacy thing that we don't recommend. So what Sally asked is, what if you know the name of your row and you just want that row? Uh, we can type in messages. And since we know the name, we'll use square brackets. We would put Wednesday in quotes. And then outside the quotes, we put our comma and we can run that. And we get the whole row for Wednesday. Again, that only works if you have row names on your object. Um, if we didn't have row names on our object, and this was pr the preferred way would be having a column of days of the week, um, we can also look for equality on if that day of the week was Wednesday. Um, all right, so we need 
logics in order to make conditional statements. And um, so we're just building in complexity. <laughs> um, so when we have conditional statements, now we're going to be saying, well, we don't want to just test for equality. We don't want to just um, find if things are, are true or false. We want to actually do something with that. And the first, um, where, we're, where we want to start is with an if statement. Typically, we don't just say, if this is true, then do that. Um, we typically say, if it's not true, do something else. So we would have an if in an else statement. Yes. 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 Uh, well, sort of. So, um, if this condition is true, then we do this statement. Otherwise, so else is more like otherwise. If it's not true, then do something else. So the then is the statement. So then do this. Um, and then the else is if it's not true, then do something else. So, for instance, um, let's just say that y hat took a value of negative 3, and um, we have an if statement. It's a function, so we have parentheses, or round parentheses. Inside of that, we have our conditional statement. Um, so, y is less than 0. If that's true, then we'll print out y is a negative number. So we'll run that, and it is true because it was negative 3, and we get y is a negative number. Um, let's see what happens if we change it to a positive number, uh, for instance, 5. We don't get anything because we didn't tell it what to do if it wasn't true. So um, we would need to have a more complicated statement. We'll get there. Uh, we're not there yet. So for uh, First, we'll do a challenge where we're going to use the last number from challenge eight. And again, last isn't saved in memory, so we have to get it again. Then we're going to write an if statement that prints your popular if the number of messages exceeds 10. So if last exceeds 10. If last is bigger than 10. Uh, then we have curly braces, so that's um, shift square bracket. And I like to put in a little bit of spacing here. In our studio, it'll automatically indent for you, so it'll be easier to track um, which things are inside your um, if else statements or if statements. And so we typed in your popular and then we close our curly brace. Um, Learn R does highlight. So when we close the curly brace, it does indicate the first one so that we know that we have a matching pair. We should be able to run that. And um, last was 14. 14 is bigger than 10. So you're popular. All right. Again, most of the time we want an if else statement because we don't want to know if something is true. We also want to be able to handle the case if it's not true. Um, and so we have if condition, if that condition evaluates to true, then we do statement one. If it evaluates to false, then we jump into the else and we do statement two. Typically, um, I put my else right after the closed curly brace of if. Um, just so that I know that it's where it's flowing, but it doesn't matter. It should work if it's on another line. All right, so um, we're going to try this again. Um, same if statement. So if y is less than zero, we'll print out it's an y is a negative number. Otherwise, else will print out y is either positive or zero. We don't know because we didn't test. And so let's see what happens when we run that. 
And we get y is a negative number because it's still negative 3. Let's see what happens if we change it to 0. We get y is either positive or 0. Let's see what happens if we change it to 5. And we get the same message, y is either positive or zero, because we're going into that else statement. Um, we don't, and we would need a further statement in order to test if it was positive or if it was zero. Uh, so that is a traditional way of doing it. We are going to preview into one function that does all of this on one line, and that's using the if else function. It condenses it down because it puts a condition in the first spot in the function. The first statement um, that will happen if the condition is true in the second spot and the statement that's going to happen if the condition is false in the third spot. And so it just takes all those six lines of code, seven, oh yeah. Um, two, three, four, five lines of code and puts it on one line. If else, the condition was y is less than zero. Um, if that's true, we say y is a negative number. If it's false, we say y is either positive or zero. We should get the same results. And we do. And you could play around with changing that number if you wanted to. All right. For our challenge 10, we're going to rewrite challenge 9 um, and give it an else condition or a condition if, in, um, if the condition is not true. We're going to say send more messages. So let's go back up to what we did for challenge 9. I'm going to copy that. And I guess I didn't need to get last again. So we're going to take this, we're going to condense it down into the if else statement or if else function and keep our condition last is bigger than 10. Um, I'm just going to copy the your popular message. And I'll get rid of that. And if last is not bigger than 10, we'll change it to, we'll, we'll print out send more messages. Last was 14, so we're going to get your popular. Let's change 10 to 15 and see what happens. Last is not bigger than 15, so we get send more messages. What happens if we change this to 14? What message are we going to get? Send more messages because last is equal to 14. It's not strictly greater than 14. And so that would evaluate to false. So we would get send more messages. Um, all right, so what's the difference between an if else statement and an else if statement? Well, this is just a more complicated um, if else um, statement. It's where we just nest them together. So now instead of um, if condition one is false, maybe we want to check condition two. And then we just add on a second if statement that second if statement can also have what happens if that condition two is false, and so that also has an if. And we can keep nesting these down as long um, as long as we want. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know if you guys do a lot of if statements in Excel, but sometimes I do, especially with grading. If I'm like trying to have Excel tell me what grade to assign somebody, and I've got like eight conditions nested together. Um, I could use R, but you know, grade books or an Excel generally. Anyway, so got a lot of if else conditions in here. Um, R is just a little bit different because instead of just saying if, um, then we have if else or we have the if else function. So 
Now we can actually get into, well, we can decide if y is zero or if it's positive. So the first condition is checking to see if y is less than zero. So that would tell us if it's a negative number. If that's false, we know it's either positive or zero. Um, so then we add in if y is equal to zero, then we know that it is zero. Otherwise, the only other option, as long as it's a real number, is that it has to be positive. So now if we run through our three numbers, if y is negative three, we get out y is a negative number. If we put in zero, we get y is zero. If we put in five, we get y is positive. Um, what about y is pi? So we can tell pi, we can just say pi, and it knows that pi is 3.14, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I like to keep this in here, um, the modulo statement, uh, even though most people probably are not going to use modulo a lot. Um, but this um, can help with deciding if things are even or it can help with allocating um, people to groups. And so what modulo does is it returns the remainder of a division, not necessarily um, the divisor itself. So if we were to say um, 5 modulo 3, 5 divided by 3 is 1 with a remainder of 2, so it returns 2. So let's try that out. 5 modulo 2. And, oops, sorry, modulo 3. 5 divided by 2 is 4 with a remainder of 1. 5 divided by 3 is 1 with a remainder of 2. And so we can use this to determine if something is even or odd. Um, or we can say, um, if x modulo 2 is 0, then we know it's divisible by 2. Um, otherwise, if x modulo 3 is equal to 0, then we know it's divisible by 3. Otherwise, it's not divisible by 2 or 3. So if x was 6, that's divisible by 2. Um, why did we only get one statement and not both? Because 6 is divisible by both 2 and 3. It hits the first condition. The first condition is true. So it prints out the first message and then it's done. It doesn't go into the second condition. It doesn't even know the second condition exists. So if we were to change x to 9, we get x is divisible by 3. If we change it to 11, we get x is not divisible by 2 or 3. Any questions about that? Most of you probably won't use that, but it's kind of fun to know that it exists. All right. So now let's talk about loops because whenever we're doing something and we're doing it multiple times, uh, it's more efficient to write a loop to have the code do it over and over again than to do it by hand over and over again because uh, you're more likely to make a mistake if you have uh, your rerunning code. So um, loops are similar to if else statements. We'll have some sort of condition. As long as the condition stays true, we'll run whatever statements we want it to do. Um, as soon as the condition evaluates to false, we'll stop running our loop. Um, there are while loops, and uh, while loops are dangerous because you don't spe specify a stopping point necessarily, and they could run infinitely. Um, Usually, if you do 
uh, a lot of programming at one point in your life, you're going to write an infinite loop that has to that will only end if you shut your computer down or force R to close. Um, for loops are safer because you're specifying a stopping point to begin with. So, for instance, if we have um, 100 numbers, we'll say for I is some index. Usually um, in looping statements, we have an index indicator that's um, maybe one to three characters. It's a lot shorter than a variable so that it stands out, makes it um, uh, obvious that it's uh, not a variable, that it's just used in the loop. So for I in one to the number, then we run the statement. Notice this does not have the percent symbols around the in. This is a different kind of in than um, checking to see if something is in a vector. Um, it's um, the in in print uh, in percent symbols came after for loops. So um, this is just an older style of doing it and. It's specifically saying, as long as I is in the sequence, we're going to keep running it. We don't need, um, I think you probably could use the percent symbol, but for specifically for the for function, you don't need it. Uh, we could also say that the sequence was the numbers 1 to 100, and then we could say for I in that sequence, as long as, um, as that remains true, then we run the statement. So what happens is we start out with I is one. Uh, um, that's less than 100 and we go through, it auto increments. So then after it, when we hit um, the end, the last curly brace, it will add one and go through again and it keeps going through until we get to the um, hundredth iteration through and then it will stop. So we can test this by just Printing out our index. And so um, all we do is we're printing out I. So we go through and it prints out the numbers 1 through 10. And then um, we can check that it made it all the way through by printing out I. I remains the last number that was um, evaluated. And so it won't be 11. It'll actually be 10. Um, it doesn't hit 11 until it goes back into the loop again. So this is another way if you get an error message when you have a for loop, I, I type in I and I see where did it stop and then that helps you kind of narrow down where my problems are. All right. So let's say that we have um, two vectors and we're going to add them together and we're going to ignore the fact that we could just say y or x plus y and add them element by element. Um, we're going to do this um, the crude way by hand and uh, we, we're going to store our results in z. So we're repeating a missing value na, the length of x, and um, so however long X is, we're going to get a vector that's set up to be the same length as X, but it has missing values stored in there. We're going to go through each element of X. Um, X is 10 elements long, and we're going to store in X uh, plus Y. Oops. And any lowercase z. Another reason why it's probably not a good idea to use X and Z by themselves. X plus, we don't want the whole vector of X. We want the ith element of X. And we want the ith element of Y. And let's see what we get. Uh, let's also print out X and y. Sometimes tab complete is too fancy. Uh, so it does look like y is the same length as x. If y was longer than x, 
it would just ignore the um, values past the 10th row or the 10th position. And um, it is, uh, oops, I have a problem here because I'm only saving the last element. I forgot my index into, uh, into Z. That looks better. 1 plus 10 is 11. 2 plus 12 is 14. All the way up to 38. So if I forget my indexing, it's only going to save the last time through the for loop. All right, so this, I was hinting at this. This is a medium challenge. I already gave you the answer of it. How do you add X and Y? You just say X plus Y. And if you want to save that into a vector, you could say Z is X plus Y. Um, then we need to print Z out. We get the same thing. Um, okay, so we're going to go a little bit uh, challenging. We're going to go back to the Blackfoot fish data set that we use for data visualization. Uh, we are going to um, read in the data set. We're going to modify the code to write a for loop. We're going to, we want to um, divide our sample into a training sample that we could run a model on and a testing sample. And this is a really complicated way of doing that, but this is a good um, uh, practical example. We're going to find the indices needed to sample every seventh row from the data set, starting with the first row. We're going to stop as soon as we've sampled um, 1,200 rows, and then we could run a model on that after that. So first we'd read in the data set. We're setting our um, size of our stopping point. So we want a sample size of 1,200. We're initializing our vector that we're going to store our indices in. Um, so we're going to temporarily have NAs in there, and it's going to be of length 1,200. And our first index, we want to be 1, because um, we want to start with the first row. Then we want to go through for I in two, we already know our first spot has to be one and we want to stop at some point. Um, where, what is our stopping point? How many elements do we want in our final vector? And testing. Then we're going to store our index in SAMPS I. We need to put something in to get the process that we in execute at every index. Um, so we want to do every seventh row. Um, so there's lots of different ways of doing this. Um, what's one way? So the second element should be eight, right? So how would we get eight from one? Yep, SAMPS, the previous, we could do that. We could do um, SAMPS I minus one plus seven. That's one way to do it. What's another way to do it? Uh, we could do it the math way. We could say I minus one times seven plus one. That goes, if, so if I is two, two minus one is one times seven plus one is eight. 
Uh, 8 plus 7 is 15, so 3 minus 1 is 2 times 7, so that would be the other way of doing it. But probably this way would be um, most intuitive. So it's the previous store value that we stored plus 7. <clears throat> Uh, then we're do you, going, yes. Do you have to set the first index to one? No. Nope. Well, like you're saying for I it is one. And so if we do your way, we would have to. Um, if we did it this way, we could start when we could start with I equals one. Right, one minus one is zero, zero times seven is zero, plus one, we would get one to start. If we did your way, we would have to have the first one be one. Um, because we would need to know, we can't, um, we can't, in R, R is one based, and so since zero is meaningless, it doesn't have anything in that zero slot. All right, so then once we have that vector, the indices, um, we could put that in for our rows. We could use that for row selection. No, you don't really need the which function. We just showed you that so that you could use that if you needed to for particular situations. That will just select those um, every seventh rows. And then we can negate that to get our um, training set. Okay, <clears throat> run this. Make sure I don't have something highlighted. And we can't say anything, it didn't print anything out because it's all just stored in memory. Um, but it's, uh, we can get um, head of stamps. And then we can see 1, 8, 15, 22, et cetera. Um, just like you can nest if else statements, you can nest for loops. And so, so if you needed to iterate through a matrix, you could go through the rows and you could go through the columns and you could do something fancy. Um, so if we wanted to um, uh, if if we if we needed to do something uh, for every row, and then we needed to change what we did for every column, then we, that's how we would do that. Okay. So when we would possibly use this in our code, say we wanted to manipulate a matrix by setting its elements to specific values based on their row and column position. So we, uh, the first one would potentially, you know, you, it could go either way. We could say the first index ran over the rows of the matrix and the second one ran over the columns. Um, and when should you use a loop whenever you're doing something over and over again, multiple times, use a loop to make uh, make your code more efficient and, and less error prone. All right. <clears throat> but if you're really doing something over and over again, um, and you're not just doing it for a singular single data frame. If you're going to do it for multiple data frames, um, then you probably want to go more advanced than a for loop and you probably want to write your own function. And this is not as scary as it sounds. Functions can be really simple with just a few instructions or they can be really complicated and be made up of multiple functions, so a function that operates on functions. Uh, the trickiest thing about functions is that you do not want to reuse a name that somebody else has used, because as soon as you do that, as long as you're in that instance, it's going to use your version instead of what was already um, uh, programmed into base R or whatever packages you're using. So for instance, don't create a function and call it mean um, unless you really want your version of mean instead of ours version of mean or use table 
LM for linear model, GLM, STR, T apply, DF. A, um, a lot of times people you name their data frames DF, but DF is a function, um, degrees of freedom. And so I don't like naming my, even though naming an object DF is different than DF the function, I still don't like reusing that name. So let's create a function that um, does something that we can intuitively check. Um, let's convert feet feet to, um, in, in feet and inches to centimeters. So first, um, we'll create the name of our function. So we're saving our function in feet underscore inch underscore two underscore cm assignment arrow. Um, the function for function is function. Uh, it's going to take two parameters. First one is going to be feet, and the second one is inches. We're naming them so we can rearrange the order. Uh, we start the function with the curly brace. We end the function with the curly brace, and what happens in the middle is the important stuff. So if we want to convert feet and inches to centimeters, first we need to um, only have either feet or inches. In this particular case, we're going to convert feet to inches. So we're going to take our feet, multiply by 12, add whatever inches we had. Then we're going to take that and convert that to centimeters. Then it's important to say what we want to come out of this. Um, you don't have to return anything, but otherwise it's a function that doesn't really look like it's doing anything. So we return centimeters. So if we run this, nothing is going to happen. Oops. Um, it, it's just creating the function. If we want to use it, now we can um, just use feet, inch, two centimeters, and we can say feet equals five inches equals six, I'll put in my height, and I can get uh, my height in centimeters out. Um, because these are named, we can change the order. We shouldn't get a different result. Uh, however, if we don't put in names, we did six comma five, that's getting somebody that's six feet and five inches. Uh, so the function, it is basically what um, the parameters that we put in the function are like our ingredients, and we mix them together in a particular way, and we return um, the particular thing that we're making, our cake or our cupcakes or our steak. Uh, so we then, so the middle part is what we are going to do with our ingredients, and then we return what our final product is going to be. Um, this uh, function scoping is something that is covered probably more um, in. Um, a lot of computer science classes, or you would think that it would be. Um, there's local functions or there's global. So if we define something outside of a function, it will be kept around and understood outside that function. If we have a variable that we only need for the purposes of that function and we define it inside a function, it won't stick around, it'll be gone. So if we have a function, that doesn't have any parameters. All that it's doing is um, taking and assigning the value of one to X and two to Y, and then concatenating X and Y. Um, then we run the function F which, with no parameters and print out X. Let's see what happens. So we didn't have to specify return. Um, it just printed out X and Y. Uh, it's not saved in F. Uh, it's not saved anywhere. It's just printing it out. So it, it's um, transient. It won't remain around. 
um, where x is one locally within that function. So I printed out one there. Y is two. If we were to print out y, y was not defined outside of the function, so it shouldn't know what it is, and it doesn't. Okay, so um, keep keep in mind, you know, where things are used. If it's inside a function, it only knows about it inside a function. And um, so for instance, we can play with changing X, the value of X. It doesn't, um, here we're defining G. Before we specify the value of X, now because then we call G, X was not defined outside of G, so it uses what it had saved in memory. It knew before from before that X was 15, it didn't know about Y, so it used the value of two. We redefined X and then it grabbed it from the global parameters. Um, so you can use that. Um, you wanna be really careful about making sure you know where your values are coming from when you write a function. So there's a lot of things that you have to be careful about when you use functions, but functions can be a lifesaver. Uh, again, if you're doing a lot of tedious work that's repetitive, that's exactly what functions are well designed for. So um, uh, because it's like a loop, it's for a process that you do multiple times. So for instance, Let's say that we want to scale a variable and we're not going to use a predefined scaling function. We're going to create our own scaling function. So we're going to take each observation and we're going to subtract the minimum value of a vector and we're going to divide it by the range or the um, difference between the maximum value of that vector and the minimum value of the vector. So we can use this to scale um, the length of a fish or the width of a fish or the, uh, sorry, the weight of a fish. And this might be something that we would do for all of our quantitative variables for a particular data set. And so we could do this by hand. Um, so we're taking, well, let's just run it the naive way and it's saving it. So it's not going to print it out. Um, uh, it's taking the length from the blackfoot fish, subtracting the minimum, removing the missing values, dividing by, and then we're using lots of parentheses to make sure that we have our numerator in the numerator position and then our denominators in the denominator position. Um, so we're dividing by the maximum, removing the missing values, minus the minimum, removing the missing values. Again, there are functions that can make this simpler, but we're just trying to illustrate a complicated process here. Um, where we've got a lot of variables in our data frame going around and we want to really make sure that we don't make a mistake. Can we make sure that we don't make a mistake? Did we make a mistake? Yeah, copy paste error, right? That's like the biggest possible error that anybody can make if they're not being careful. So we just forgot one place to replace where we would replace length with weight and that would really mess up our conversion here. So we're gonna work through in the last eight minutes, writing a function to do this instead of doing it by hand. So the first thing that we wanna do is um, we want to actually, let's look at what we get here. And so our end goal is that we have um, a variable that scales between zero and one. So all of these values should be between zero and one. And so we wanna return this snippet of code into something that we can apply to any numeric vector. So the first step is to examine the process to determine how many inputs there are. We go back up here. We've got one variable, blackfoot fish length. 
and we just do um, use that in three different ways. So we only have one variable, one input, and we'll have one output. So we're getting out the scaled variable. So then we want to figure out how to change the snippet into um, the output that we want using temporary variables or local variables. So we're going to break this down. So we're not going straight to the end result. So we're just modifying the code snippet above to refer to a temporary variable X. And we want to make sure our code does not depend on a specific data set. So, and we're going to save the rescaled vector in a variable called x rescaled. Go back up here. I'm just going to copy the whole code. I'm saving flatfoot fish length in x. So, wherever I see that, I'm going to replace it with x. And I want to make sure that I save this in X rescale. And let's print out head of X rescale. Let's print out head of X as well. All right, so originally X was 232, 208, 164. Rescaled, um, they're all values between zero and one. All right, now, is there any other duplication that we have? We use minimum twice, maximum once. So maybe it would make sense to store the minimum value and then we can, um, since we're reusing that twice. Uh, we can also use the range function for the bottom. And so let's see, and maybe, let's see what we get uh, with using the range function. If we have a sequence from one to five, the range function gives us two numbers, one and five. It gives us the minimum value and the maximum value. So how can we use that? Here. Uh, so we want to make sure that we um, find when we find the range of X that we don't call it range. Remember, that's a, a that's a reserved word. So we'll call it X range. So now let's create an X range. We're going to start back up here. We're going to take what we have done so far. And um, now, well, actually, put this down here. And for first, we need X range. And that's going to be the range of X. I got that in there twice, but it's okay. Oh, and we forgot to print it out. So run these three lines of code. And the minimum value is 16, and the maximum value is 986. So now we want to reuse that wherever we see min or max. So instead of min, we're going to put in x range. How do we access the first element of a vector? Square brackets one, yes. And so we're gonna do that. Both places where we have minimum. And how do we access the maximum? Instead of one, we put in two. Let's see if we get the same thing. Are those numbers similar to what we got up here? Scroll a little bit. 
looks looks the same to me. So we did the right thing. All right, well, this is already easier to read, right? Um, and maybe we can put a comment in here, range uh, gives the min first and max second. So that will help us remember uh, what is in that variable. Now we just need to put it in a function. So remember, you name your function, then you call the function function, and you give it the parameters or the inputs that you need, and then you do the operation that you need to do. So here, we're going to use the function template, and we're going to call the function rescale. And notice if we are go slow, rescale has already been defined. Um, but you can go type slowly to make sure that it's not something that the um, computer already knows about. What is our input? We're going to call it X because we want it to work for any vector that we give it. The first thing that we needed to do was um, get the range of X. using the range function and we put in our input X and we want to make sure we remove the missing values. Running out of time. So I'm just going to copy our function here. And then we return X rescaled. And we can put in a vector X. And so let's just say that X is the numbers one through five. And we rescale that. Um, let's see. Yeah. Let me just copy this real quick. All right. So um, if we get all the way to uh, 19, um, you can put this together and you can generate a nice little plot and um, go through and um, calculate the condition scale or the condition factor for each fish. And so that's the um, the gotcha or the, the reward for this process. So all the little pieces, all the logicals, all the inequalities, all, um, all the loops come together into writing a function. And again, wherever you can reuse code, um, write code to reuse code so that you're not copying and pasting and making errors and forgetting what you did. All right. So two weeks uh, data wrangling. Um, we, we're not going to go through the same things. Um, we're going to do uh, more advanced data wrangling, but it's um, using tidy R, which is more like accessing um, SQL databases or Python. It uses more similar language. You know what that is. Um, and it, it's more of a, doing some data wrangling using um, common English words that we would think about if we're talking about what we're doing. So less programming, you are still be programming, but you're going to be thinking about it a different way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs>